said we're getting towards the end of the day so this is going to be a more relaxed talk I'll give you a little break in the middle where you can stretch your legs and stuff uh, and I just want to start out by actually doing a reverse Q&A so I want to ask you guys some questions how many of you here are Python developers you use Python in your day jobs okay good it's PyCon so that makes sense how about Django developers how many of you use Django every day okay good you came to the right talk how many of you have used Django for more than three years Oh, wow, okay, good. That's a good number of you. How many of you prefer the Django ORM over SQL Alchemy? <laughs> okay, cool. Tough crowd. I'll have, to sell, I'll have to sell you on it. All right, so this talk is about distributed systems, and I'm going to go through and explain what that is in a little bit. But first, I'm going to talk about dealing with critical data in general. A little bit of background first. My name is Nick Sweeting. Um, I'm the squash on Twitter, uh, pirate on GitHub. I am the co-founder of Monatical, um, which is where Milton and Juan and a bunch of our other awesome friends work. You should definitely apply. We are hiring right now. We build Oddslingers. Oddslingers is a poker platform, and we're expanding to eSports later. And we built the whole thing in Django channels and Python, and we had to learn a lot of lessons along the way because building a game engine has a lot of unique aspects. Um, you need real-time data, and you need to make sure that information is never lost or destroyed because people really care about those internet points. And a little disclaimer, I'm not a distributed systems expert. I just have learned a little bit over time. I've made a lot of mistakes, and so I have a few lessons to share. It all starts with a single salami slice. So how many of you have seen Superman 3? <laughs> all right, a couple, a couple. How many of you have seen Office Space? All right, so maybe if you know the plots of these movies, uh, there's a pretty interesting part where an accountant in Superman 3 is looking through his paychecks and he sees that every month he gets something like $420.42. But he knows that actually it's not 42 cents, it's 0.425194, you know, some fractional cents after the 42 cents. And he gets to thinking, you know, when I get my paycheck every month, it only has 42 cents. What happens to the rest of those cents after the 0.42? Where does it all go? And so he writes a program that collects all of those fractional cents and puts them in an account. And at the end of the year, he gets something like $300,000. So that process is called salami slicing. And it's something you have to watch out for when you're dealing with money and critical data. So as I walk through, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about the basic data types for dealing with money. I'm going to talk about concurrency. I'm going to talk about how to avoid concurrency, which is really what you want to do most of the time. I'm going to talk about database design. I'm going to talk about setting the configurations of your database properly so that you don't lose the data. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the hardware and sort of the bigger picture human problems that you have to deal with when you're dealing with critical data, either in banking or gaming. So math is hard. Don't do math. If you're dealing with money, try to avoid math if at all possible. So as I mentioned early, earlier, fractional cents are one example of math going wrong. So the way to fix this in Django is to use decimals and decimal fields. So instead of storing things in, in floats, um, store everything in decimals, which keeps track of the, of the remaining decimals properly and, and doesn't have sort of rounding error. And when you save it to the database, it's also very important to use a decimal field. Also, if you're thinking about salami slicing in your, in your day job, don't do it. You'll get caught. Accountants know how to catch it these days. So starting out with the basics, float versus decimal. Um, if you haven't seen this sort of error before, it may be surprising. So in Python, if you add 0 0.1 to 0 0.2, you actually don't get 0 0.3, you get 0 0.3004. And that's because floats aren't actually precise. Floats don't store a perfect number. Um, they store a base and a mantissa. And that means that you don't actually have perfect precision. Um, you'll accumulate error as you do math using floats, and that can be very, very dangerous with money. So the correct solution is to use decimal. Decimal um, stores it properly internally and keeps track of the decimal places. Another thing that may be surprising, uh, maybe not in Colombia, but if you come from the US, this is absolutely crazy. Rounding behavior is just bonkers in Python. Um, for Europeans, Europeans, apparently this is normal, but this is called rounding to nearest half even. So in Python, if you round 1.5, it rounds down to 2, which is strange. You'd think, it, uh, yeah, sorry, it rounds up to 2. But if you round 2.5, instead of rounding up to 3, it rounds down to 2. It doesn't round to the nearest whole integer, it rounds to the nearest even integer. So be very, very careful if you're ever doing rounding in Python. <laughs> 
So if you want the correct behavior, or I should say correct, the, the USA behavior, I guess, in Europe, they, they think this is the normal thing, um, you can use decimal.quantize. So in distributed systems, most of the dragons and most of the problems that you'll encounter happen when you deal with concurrency. Concurrency is when you have multiple processes doing something at once. So first, I'm going to talk about avoiding this, because if you can avoid concurrency, that's the best possible way to do things. And it eliminates all the dragons. So let's talk about what is a distributed system first. It turns out every Django app is a distributed system. Even if you only run Django on a single computer, it's already a distributed system. And the reason why is because you usually have multiple workers processing requests in Django. And then all of those workers use database connections to make changes to the database. So as soon as you have more than one worker, you are already running a distributed system. So what happens when two of these processes try to do something at the same time? Let's say you're a bank, for example, and you have a balance for each of your users, and you want to update, you want to withdraw some money. What happens if two requests come in at the same time, and you have to withdraw that money from the balance in both requests at the same time? So if you don't think about this, and you just dive right in and you implement it, something really scary will happen. And this is called a talk to bug. And that stands for time of check to time of use. So in a lot of Django example code, you'll see something like this, where you have the balance, you check, you do some logic, then you subtract a number from the balance, and then you save it. But think about, if you have two processes doing this at the same time, if both of them get to line two, and both of them subtract $100, at the end, you have $0 instead of negative $100. So if the user starts with $100, both processes come in and subtract $100, that's $200 withdrawn. You don't want to end up with 0 in the account. You want to have negative 100. So it's really important to, to prevent this kind of bug. So at our company, at Oddslingers, we run poker. And if you haven't played poker before, uh, I'll explain a little bit. So poker, in poker, there are tables. And you sit down at a table, and you play cards with people at that table. And each table is separate, which is nice. But if one user has two tabs open with the same table, and they submit two different actions in both tabs at the same time, we can't accept both actions. We can only accept one action, right? So we have to think of a way to pick one action when we have two processes doing something at the same time. And in the case of poker, that would be something like bet or fold. And there's a lot of money in the, on the line when this happens. Like if, if they bet uh, when they should have folded, or if they fold when they should have bet, you, the, the company could lose millions of dollars. So, one of the easiest solutions is to actually remove the concurrency. Instead of having the logic happen in both threads simultaneously, you queue up an operation, you put it on a queue, and then you have a separate process run through all of the operations in the queue and apply them to the database. And when I mean separate process, I don't mean one process per server. I don't mean you know, one process per data center. I mean literally one process for the entire company running on one server. And it runs through all the operations, and it applies them one by one. And when you do things this way, you can't have a talk to bug, because only one piece of Python logic can happen at a time. You'll never have race conditions. So one way to do this is to actually store your database operations in a data structure of some kind, so that you can put it in a queue. And so for example, let's say you'd put a timestamp. Uh, this is a tuple of a database operation. You'd have a timestamp. You'd have the condition, the thing you want to check. And then you have the thing you want to do if that condition is true. So then you would queue up these operations in a list, and then you'd have a separate process run through all of these and execute them. And if there's only one process, no conflicting rights can occur. So here's an example of that implementation. Your separate process would have a while loop. It would uh, unpack that transaction, I'm going to call it. It would check, is the condition true? And then it would execute the condition. So now see, instead of having two separate branches, we only have one, and the numbers stay consistent. When the next minus 100 balance comes in, we execute it, and we get the proper balance 0 at the end. So if you can, always eliminate concurrency at all costs. It's the simplest solution, and it will save you a lot of headache over time. If you value your sanity, do this. All right, if you think you can eliminate concurrency, that's it for you. The talk is over. You're welcome to get up and leave. Uh, you don't even have to watch the rest of the talk. I won't be offended. Don't worry. Unfortunately, that's not always possible. Once a system gets to a certain size, you're going to have to deal with concurrency. So let's talk about the tools that Django provides to deal with concurrency. Those are transactions, locking, and compare and swaps. So here's where things get dangerous. This is where you really need to think hard about each problem. So to run through the tools that the ORM provides, atomic transactions are a really powerful tool. 
they let you wrap a series of operations, and if any one of them fails, you roll them back. Locking is another thing. It's also known as pessimistic concurrency. And it's called pessimistic because you assume that other people are trying to compete with you. You assume that two processes are trying to do something at the same time, and you lock. You prevent them from doing that until your logic is over. The alternative is something called compare and swaps. So compare and swaps are atomic operations that happen instantaneously. You can never have two processes do an atomic operation at the same time. They're always ordered, and that happens at the database layer. So this is an example of a transaction in Django. Let's say you have a request come into your view, and you need to, do, you need to modify like three or four different models. Instead of just running them normally in your view, and then if an exception happens, two of the models are modified, but one of them is left broken, you wrap them all inside of this with transaction.atomic block. And what that means is, if any exception is raised during that transaction, all of the operations that you did will be rolled back. They won't be committed to the database. So this is great when you need to perform multiple operations at once for a piece of logic, and you don't want to have partially committed state in your database. Another cool thing is that transactions can be nested. So you can have a smaller transaction inside of a bigger one that's allowed to fail without failing the bigger one. Or you can let the exception uh, bubble all the way up, and all of the transactions will fail. So Django is really powerful this way. Um, other ORMs let you do this as well, but it's, it's especially nice in Django. So the next thing that the ORM provides is locking, row locking. And this is called pessimistic concurrency, as I mentioned earlier. And the way to do that in Django is with select for update. So you select, you do a filter, and you select the rows that you want to modify. And then you call select for update on the query set. And what that does is that obtains a lock. And a lock is something that prevents other processes from writing to the same models. So essentially, if any other process wants to modify the model, they also have to obtain a lock. And they won't be able to obtain that lock until our first lock is released. So this is a great strategy. Most of the time, you can solve your concurrency problems with locking. Unfortunately, if two processes both try to obtain a lock, like if one process it modifies one model, but it needs a lock on a different model, and the other process has a model that needs a lock on a different model, you can enter something called deadlock, where both processes are waiting for the other process to release the lock. So to solve that problem, you have to use atomic compare and swaps. So compare and swaps are also known as optimistic concurrency. And they're called optimistic because you actually assume that no one else is trying to, to, trying to modify the model at the same time. You're optimistic. You hope this is actually going to work just fine, and no one else is going to conflict with me. And the way that works is you get your model out of the database first, and you read off a version string, or a timestamp that's the last modified timestamp, or something that changes every time the model is updated. Then you perform all, all your logic. And right before you commit to the database, you check, is the version in the database the same version that I got out when I wanted to do my logic? And that tells you, has another process come in and tried to modify this while I was doing my logic? And if another process has already changed it, the version will be different than the one we have in memory, and we fail. We bail out, and we try it again. Unfortunately, this is very difficult to get right. There are a lot of things that you can do wrong that will shoot yourself in the foot when you're doing atomic compare and swaps. So try locks first, and then revert to atomic operations uh, second as a last resort. So one thing I want to mention before I move on for atomic compare and swaps is that if you have to modify multiple models at the same time, just because a single line is atomic doesn't mean that all of, the, all of them are atomic. You have to put them all inside of a transaction. And the other thing is, when you check the version as you're writing, it can't be two different lines. You can't check the version and then write, because then you just have the talk to bug again. So actually, the check for the version and the write needs to be all one line, all one operation. And the way you do that is you filter, you check. For the version that I have, if the rows exist with that version still, then update them. Otherwise, fail. There's another solution, which is a lot more advanced, and that's a hybrid solution. And a lot of database engines and more complex pieces of software use something like this internally. And that's where you split up your logic into two steps, the read phase and the write phase. During the read phase, you use optimistic concurrency. You check the version. You perform your logic. And then only for the write phase, for the models that have the version that you got, obtain a lock. And then for that very, very short write phase, it's going to be much shorter than the rest of your logic. You lock the models, and you perform all the operations at once. So this is called MVCC. It's, it's fairly advanced. But if you, if you encounter a situation where locking enough is, not, alone, is not, uh, not enough and atomic compare and swaps alone are also not enough, think about using a hybrid approach.
So let's talk about designing your schema so that you can sleep safely at night. Specifically, I want to go over what is log structured data and how can we minimize locking with good schema design. So let's go back to our bank example. Pretend you're a bank. You have a bunch of users, and you need to keep track of a balance for each user. Alice has $52, and Bob has 21. The classic way to store this data is with a normal table. You just have Alice and a balance, a column balance, and you store the value. And then you have Bob as a row, and the, the value for the balance is 21. This is normal, mutable data storage. This is probably what you use every day in Django. A different approach is to use log structured data. So instead of storing a mutable balance for each user that you query and then update, you actually store immutable rows that track all of the money in and out of each account. So for example, Alice's very first transaction was to deposit $100. You create a table called transactions, or transfers, depending on how you want to name it. And each row will be a timestamp, the model, and then the change. And then all of the rows are the changes that are applied to that user. So then if you want to get the balance for the user at the end of the day, you add up all of the rows in the table for Alice, and you get their total resulting balance. And this has some really nice properties. Each row is immutable, meaning no other process can ever mutate a row. You can only add new rows. So that means you can ship this log around, and as long as the timestamps are accurate, you can merge two logs on two different servers, and the resulting balance at the end of the day will be correct. But note that I said as long as timestamps are accurate. Timestamps are a really hard problem. Google solved it by putting atomic clocks in all their data centers that synchronize their databases to within nanoseconds. If you're not Google and you don't have access to atomic clocks, don't rely on timestamps being accurate, because the timestamps from two different machines could be slightly different. You have to synchronize the time very carefully and understand what happens if the time between two servers is slightly out of sync. Given that problem, log structure storage is still a very powerful solution, because Usually, you don't have things happening within nanoseconds. So log structured storage is a, is a core foundational building block of distributed systems. Almost all distributed systems and, and databases use log structured storage internally somehow. And the reason why they do that is because, as I said before, each row is immutable. All of the writes are strictly ordered. A write can only happen before or after another write. And another cool property is you can revert to the state of your database at any point in time. So if you want to see what Alice's balance was two months ago, you just add up all of the rows up to the point two months ago. So it actually gives you the history of all of the state changes for your database and not just the most recent value. And that's a really powerful pattern. It turns out a lot of pieces of software use this pattern. Take Redux, for example. I don't know how many of you guys do front-end programming. How many of you have used Redux? Raise your hand. Cool. So Redux, on its surface, looks like you have some state that's mutable and you update the state. But actually, it's not. You have a bunch of operations, and Redux runs through those and applies purely functional transformations of your state from one state to the next state. And that allows you to rewind to any point in time, just like the database allows you to rewind to Alice's balance at any point in time. A lot of things use this internally. For example, CouchDB. Um, Redis, also, if you turn on Redis Persistence, it'll save uh, a log to your disk that is a log-structured format. But there's a problem. If you store everything in log-structured format, what do you lock? If you have two processes that want to update Alice's balance, let's say, and you have a table with everybody in the whole bank's transactions mixed together, how do you prevent Alice's balance from going under zero while you're doing your transaction? What do you lock? Do you lock the whole table? If you lock the whole table, no one else in your bank can do transactions. So if you have a SQL table that's in log-structured format, you have to think very, very carefully about how you do locking. One solution is to have a separate model that serves as a semaphore. So let's take the balance example again. You have this table with everyone's transfers in and out of people's accounts. And if I want to withdraw some money from Alice's account without letting any other process take her balance before, below zero while I'm doing it, we could create a second model called user balance. This model doesn't have to have anything inside of it. It can even be empty. And what you do is, in your code base, you require that anyone who wants to update Alice's balance by adding a new transfer to the log-structured format has to first obtain a lock on the semaphore model, which is a separate model. And that way, you have a single row 
that you can lock that prevents a specific user's balance from being updated. And that way, you don't have to lock the entire transfers table, which is disastrous if you're a big company. So in this example, we actually put stuff in this model. It's not just an empty semaphore model that you just lock for the sake of locking. We put the total in there. And the reason why that's useful is because, as a bank, what's the most common operation you have to do? You have to look up the total for each user. And when you have to do that, you have to scan through the entire transfers table and add up all the numbers. And that's very expensive. So instead of storing the total only in the transfers table, we can also put it on the semaphore model. That way, whenever you want to update a user's balance, you lock their balance, you add the new transfer, you update the balance, and then you unlock. And that way, their balance is for sure not being modified by any other process while you're doing it. And you don't have to scan the entire table to get their balance when you want the latest value. So this is a full example, a full code example, um, using locking. So we have the transaction atomic, so that everything is happening together or not at all. And this is an example where we take some money from one user and we send it to another. So first, we lock both the source and the destination users. And this is the semaphore model, meaning no new transfers can be added to the table for these users while the lock is obtained. Then we check to make sure they have enough balance. And there's no talk to bug here, because we've already locked the models. They will never change while we're doing this check. Then we create the new transfer and add it to the balance transfer table. And then we update the totals on the two semaphore models. And then the tra transaction completes. And remember, if any part of this fails, the whole thing fails. So the entire operation now becomes atomic. Money will be sent from one account to another, and the balance transfer will be added to the table, or not at all. So to summarize, log structure data is amazing. You should think about when you can use it, because it'll solve a lot of problems. But you have to think carefully about how you minimize locking and how you can access aggregate values, that is, some scans over the entire table, quickly without having to scan over the entire table. Another way to do that is with caching, but that's very difficult, as they say. One of the hardest problems in computer science, other than naming, is caching. So now I want to talk, I want to spend the bulk of my time in the talk talking about the bigger picture and the human problems around distributed systems and sort of what the state of, of tech today is and the tools that it gives us to deal with these problems. And also new SQL databases. So one thing we did at our company that was quite successful is we told all of the engineers to, we haven't fully implemented this, but uh, we're, we're in the process of it. We want to put all of the database writes in a single file, and we call that transactions.py. And that way, you don't have the database write code interleaved with your view code. And that way, when it's, when it's all in a single file, you can pay a distributed systems expert $100,000, and he'll review just that file. And you can make sure that the only allowed writes in your code base are in that one file. And if anyone wants to modify the database, they cannot query and dot .save. They cannot you know, atomic update. They have to import the function from that file that's tested and verified to be correct. So before we move on, I want to give you all a quick 60-second break. You can stand up, stretch your legs, talk to your neighbors, because um, now I'm going to dive into the, the future state of new SQL databases. So 60 seconds, off you go. Take your time. <laughs> Hello, hello. All right. Everyone back? Enjoyed your short break? <laughs> 
maybe take a stretch. It's the end of the day, you can relax. Apologies to the video people in, in advance for having to edit out that minute break. <laughs> so another thing that we don't often think about as developers who work at a higher level of abstraction than hardware engineers is that hardware isn't perfect. Bit flips happen. Someone runs MC butterflies in their Emacs console a thousand miles away, a butterfly flaps its wings, and a cosmic ray lands on your hard drive and flips a bit. What happens when you're a bank and that bit flip is, is the most significant bit of someone's balance and suddenly they get a million dollars? So to model this problem, we have to think differently than backend engineers who just trust that everything below us works. And if you're someone who deploys critical systems, you have to ask your hosting provider, do you use ECC RAM? ECC RAM is a form of checksum RAM that makes sure that if a bit flip happens in your RAM, it can be corrected by some parity bits afterwards. Another thing that can happen is bit flips in your file system. So most people don't know that file systems aren't checksummed normally. If you just use a uh, like HFS or, or NTFS or FAT, these file systems don't really have parity to correct th uh, when things go wrong. They can tell you that an error has occurred, but there's no way to, to recover from it. So there are a couple of great file systems out there that solve this problem. ZFS, BTRFS, and they're, they're amazing. I highly recommend ZFS. If you've never used it, uh, you should definitely check it out. Another thing that you should think about is your backup strategy. So some companies do this using streaming replication. Postgres and MySQL both have this. And that's where you sync what's called a write-ahead log from one database to a replica. So from a primary to a replica or multiple replicas. And coming back to log structured data, the format that's actually synced between these servers is very similar to a log structured data format. The write-ahead log is just a statement in a log of every write that happens. And it's actually committed to the write-ahead log before it's committed to the database. So you can be sure that when, it, when it's synced to another computer, if there's any power outage or something happens, both databases can come up and check, OK, did you perform this write at this time? No, I didn't. OK, let me catch up. And then they rewind. And as I mentioned earlier, Google solved the, the, the problem of timestamps with atomic clocks. Not everyone has access to atomic clocks. So you have to think very carefully about how you synchronize time between your servers. And you have to make sure that you understand the failure cases when the timestamps are colliding or different. So what happens if two processes both submit a transfer with exactly the same timestamp? How do they get ordered? Is one before the next? Is it stochastic? Does it happen randomly? Or do you have a deterministic fashion to order the writes? So you have to think very carefully about that. Make sure you understand all levels of your, of your database. All right. Now, probably the most important word of the talk, backups. I'm going to say it five times. Backups, 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 backups. You have to have backups. And preferably, they should be off-site backups. And they have to be tested. A backup that isn't tested is not a backup. It's just a bunch of bits on a computer that don't mean anything. When you run your backup system, you should regularly fail over your entire production database to the backup server. If you don't do this, you don't actually know that it works. So. This slide on its own could be 20 more talks. And I can't spend forever on this slide, but I'm going to explain a little bit about what database isolation levels are. So your database actually has a setting. And in Django, you'll add this under uh, databases, options, isolation level. And this setting determines how much you allow your database to have transactions overlap. In a perfect world, the database would take transactions coming in and it would execute them one after another. And no two transactions would ever happen at the same time. That would be amazing. If we could live in this world, I would love to, I would love to be there. The thing is, that's not always possible. Think about a query that takes 30 seconds to run. If you had a database that was 100% serialized and you performed a 30-second query, all of the other queries for your database would be blocked waiting for that one to complete. So this setting allows you to tune how much you want to allow transactions to overlap, and specifically, how much you want to allow partially committed state in, the, in these transactions to leak into other transactions. And what I mean by that is if you have a transaction and you're, you're checking balance and then you're saving balance, and then you have another transaction that wants to check balance, this setting determines whether that balance that's saved in the transaction before the transaction finished is available for the second transaction to view. By default, MySQL and Postgres are not on the safest setting. If you're a bank, this is very, very important to understand. If you handle any critical data, this is important to understand. If your isolation level is anything less than strict serializable, which it is by default, 
and you can't really have it serializable because then your bank is very slow and no one would use you, then you need to understand what happens with partially committed data between transactions. So this is an extremely complicated topic, and there are lots of people much smarter than me who've, do, who've done lots of research on it. Namely, uh, Aphir, Kyle Kingsbury, I think is his name. He wrote a suite of tests called the Jepson tests. And when MongoDB first came out, MongoDB miserably failed the Jepson tests. And what that means is when MongoDB uh, was performing some operations, it either failed to commit them in 100% of cases, or there was a bunch of leaked data between them. Anyway, there are a bunch of problems. Since then, the Jepson tests have sort of become the de facto standard by which we measure distributed systems and data stores. So if you want to understand the failure modes for data stores, you should check out the Jepson tests. And there are amazing blog posts that go into detail about what it means for databases to be less than strictly serializable or linear linearizable. It's always hard to say. And definitely check him out, because he's also a cool guy for other reasons. Something that not everyone knows is that in Django, it's possible to use multiple databases. Not only is it possible to use multiple databases, it's possible to have transactions span multiple databases. This is incredibly powerful, because it means that you can have all of your critical data in a database with a very high isolation level, and have all of your less critical data in a database with a lower isolation level for speed. And then you can create a, a nested transaction. And the way that works is you have a, an atomic block with another one inside of it. And each block specifies which database it's for. And then you do your operations to both databases. And if any exception happens inside, both transactions get unrolled on both separate databases. So this is very powerful. You can store user balance in a very safe database and your you know, bio and user profile picture in a separate one. So I want to go into a little bit about what the future of databases looks like. As I mentioned earlier, Google thought about this pretty hard, and they released a system called Spanner. Spanner is their globally distributed MySQL database, and it stays synchronized with atomic clocks between their data centers. Think about for a second how hard a globally distributed MySQL database is. You can have latency of 200, 300, 400, even up to a second between data centers. If you have to lock things between multiple data centers and perform queries that stay consistent, it's very, very difficult in a SQL environment. SQL provides some guarantees about what's allowed and what's not allowed. And as soon as you separate the servers by a large physical distance or latency, those sort of break down and it becomes very hard. So one of the algorithms that is very interesting to understand if you're into this sort of thing is Raft and Paxos before that. Raft is slightly more approachable to engineers. There's a, there are a few great websites that explain Raft. And what Raft is, is it's what's called a consensus algorithm. A consensus algorithm determines how separated actors reach a consensus about what the state of a data store should be. The way Raft does that is you have multiple masters. So it's not a, a primary and a replica like MySQL. In fact, all of the databases are masters. They can all perform queries, and they're all at an even level. And Raft elects a leader. And the leader is responsible for committing the writes. So whenever you make a write query, it'll go to the leader, and the leader will trickle it down. And as long as you have a majority quorum of your servers accepting writes, then it will stay consistent. And if a network partition happens, Raft figures out who the next leader should be. And there's an election cycle, and there, there are many more complicated parts of Paxos and Raft. But the basic part to understand is that it's a way of deciding who's responsible for what data being where, and making sure that two servers are never both responsible at the same time. And that's a surprisingly hard problem in computer science. So these guys implemented Spanner and Google, and they're thinking, hey, this is probably an idea worth a lot to many people. And so they quit Google, and they started a company called CockroachDB. CockroachDB is very similar to Spanner. It doesn't require atomic clocks, but it's a globally distributed Postgres-compatible SQL store. Spanner is awesome. I highly recommend checking it out. They have a, it's, it's entirely written in Go, as far as I know. And they use Raft under the hood, and they separate the key space of the database into many different masters. So your query will always go to the one that's going to respond fastest. And this is great if you're a company that operates in Europe, specifically in Germany. Germany has very strict laws about where data needs to be housed. So for German customers, German data needs to be in Germany. With MySQL, this is very difficult. <laughs> you don't want to just split up your database and put half the customer, you know, a fraction of your customers physically in Germany and then have to deal with all these queries. So you can use something like Spanner to pin certain rows to certain regions of your database. If Germany goes down, only Germany goes down. <laughs> Everyone else can still access their data. Then another company came along, 
They're called PingCap. PingCap was thinking about this, and they're like, oh, that's really cool. But the whole engine is written in Go. We want something faster. So they implemented another version of Raft in Rust. And what they did is they built a key value store that's consistent in Rust. And then they built a database layer on top of that, a query engine on top of that. So CockroachDB and TIDB both work in Python. And I want to say they both work in Django, but not yet. So if all of you want to help me and help yourselves and help the community move forwards, please go onto CockroachDB and TIDB's websites and comment requesting Django support. Because they sort of support Postgres and MySQL, but Django requires very specific things. And there's a list of five or six tickets left before it'll support Django. So to summarize, never stop worrying. Distributed systems are hard. You should be losing some sleep about this process. Think very carefully about when two processes are doing something at the same time. But more simply, think about your basic data structures. Make sure you're not using floats for money. If you are doing high performance stuff with money, you'll know when you need floats, but try not to use them until then. Don't use round unless you know exactly what it's doing. You can use quantize to fix that behavior. Try not to execute writes in a multi-threaded environment. Try to centralize all of your operations to a single queue and then perform them atomically. You can use locking for basic things with select for update. And for more complex operations, you can use atomic compare and swaps. One thing I forgot to mention is uh, you, you have to use F expressions uh, for atomic operations. Uh, F expressions atomically update a value depending on the row, depending on the value already in the row. So Google F expressions if you're going to use atomic operations. One last thing before I finished. I mentioned earlier that you can't lock a whole table full of transfers um, because it would, it would block your whole bank. There is actually a solution to that called SQL gap locking. This is fairly advanced. You can actually perform a query and lock all future rows that might be added that match that query. So you can do a select for update with a filter on rows that don't exist yet. And as long as that lock is held, the database will prevent new rows from being added that match that filter. So that's a fairly advanced solution to the issue of locking tables where many new rows are added that are part of different, different entities. So I want to give some special thanks to the Django core team, all the contributors to Django. You've made this community amazing. Um, whoops, that's the, the PyCon 2019 organizers. I forgot to update that part. Um, and Andrew Godwin, in particular, he single-handedly basically wrote Django channels and then took the Django ORM and made it async compatible. And that's amazing. If you've ever used Tornado and SQL Alchemy, it's like going back to the dark ages after Django. The migration system is, in Django is, is very nice. And what you can do is actually use the Django ORM in non-Django projects. You can Im import the Django ORM in Flask, in Bottle, in Pyramid, in any project you want. The Django ORM is not specifically tied to Django, and it's a very powerful tool for keeping consistent data. Also, I want to give thanks to, to Afer, who wrote the Jepson tests, and my friend Tyler Neely for getting me into distributed systems to begin with. Final disclaimer, I am not an expert in this subject. I've just made a lot of mistakes and, and had a lot of deadlocks happen. <laughs> you should definitely get a professional and pay them lots of money to review your transactions.py file. Also, my company is hiring. Monatical is awesome. We're fully remote. We're based in Columbia. We do esports and gaming and internet archiving and mesh networking and a bunch of cool stuff. And we'll fly you to Medellin for the first month for training. And then it's fully remote and flexible hours after that. You can find the slides for this talk here, along with further info about SQL gap blocking. Um, and further reading, I have a bunch of articles and other talks linked to. Thanks. It's time for Q&A.